So we have so much to cover today, and I, I really do want to jump right into it. But before we start, I want to just clarify that we're probably going to throw out a lot of terms that some people may not understand, like HRT, bioidenticals, or MHT, MST. A lot of these acronyms can be confusing. And if you never heard of these terms before, that's okay. HRT is hormone replacement therapy. Some people call it replenishment therapy. MHT is menopause hormone therapy, menopause support therapy. Essentially, we're talking all about the same thing, although they had some nuances in, in between, and we can talk about that. And bioidenticals are bioidentical hormones, and we're going to talk about this more specifically later on. Uh, are there any other words that we're going to use, Dr. Rosenstreet or, or Jill? The. If we use the word the, the. <laughs> refer to something. Yeah. Okay. If we do, we got to make sure we clarify because I've had people so often in my community ask me when they're new, they arrive, what is MHT? Um, yeah. or, uh, you know, it's, it's uh, OHRT or, you know, they're very confused. So we will clarify for you. So in our circles, especially Jill, because you have your community as well in menopause um, and you're doing very much the same work as I am in trying to advocate for women going through this, this transition. And it seems as though every woman is now screaming about menopause at the top of their lungs. Like we're getting this discussion out in the open. We hear more and more about it becoming less and less taboo in our sort of circles. But when I travel around the world, interviewing women from Europe to Asia, they they sometimes look at me a little strange when I stop them on the street. Of course, that's totally normal. And then I ask them about five questions about menopause. And, and by the tone of their voice and their replies, it's almost like, why is this even a thing? And so I'd like to ask both of you too, we'll start with Jill. Why do you think that menopause is such a big deal? Yeah, I think I, I get the same response from women when I do. And I've been doing a lot of talks to small groups recently, which has been a lot of fun because there's, you get that instant feedback. And what I hear from women is they just didn't realize all that came along with menopause. They're thinking about it in terms of hot flashes and maybe some symptoms, but I think the bigger picture, which is loss, which women are not aware of is that there's all these silent physiologic changes that occur in our bodies as a result of hormonal decline. So they're not connecting things, maybe even later on in their menopausal transition that tie back to hormonal decline, but there's this slew of symptoms from cardiovascular symptoms to bone loss, brain changes, vaginal changes, you know, the whole list of symptoms that are silently happening. And so I think it's just something that we, as women were never taught. We were not educated about it. We had that talk in junior high about periods and pregnancy and hormones and the way they relate to those two things. But in terms of whole body health, it just wasn't part of the bigger discussion. So I think there's just this sort of mystery. Women just are not in the know and we're trying to get them in the know. Yes, actually, you're right. And that's and that's sort of what I feel as well, where they don't really yeah. make that association that yeah. it could be menopause. It's just mm -hmm. aging or something like that. And yeah. not necessarily, right? Dr. Rosensweet, what do you think? I love where Jill took it immediately. I think the emphasis should be on exactly what Jill said. Yeah, you know, 80% of women who are in midlife and they're getting that hormonal decline that's significant, they do experience symptoms, hot flashes. Okay, a few hot flashes during the day. And, uh, but as it starts, and for 80% of the women, uh, sometimes those symptoms get stop life stopping. If a woman wakes up in the middle of the night, for example, we all know what it's like to lose one night's sleep, let alone let's talk three or something like that. <laughs> and yeah. I've always thought that that was a gift, that symptoms, when you pay attention to them, they really want you to ask, well, what the heck's going on here? I can't function well. What the heck's going on? They want the right answer. And it drives many women to get motivated midlife they never knew about it a day before the symptoms started. When I talk to, when I teach young nurse practitioners, for example, about treating women in menopause and they haven't had a symptom, it's a real different world. Yeah. They don't understand. But you take a woman who has woken up in the middle of the night a couple of times or has gotten vaginal dryness 
or her mood has changed or she's losing muscle strength or getting flab here. These women do understand this. Yeah. And that's an important moment. And it's a wonderful opportunity to help a woman to get off, get back on the horse and keep riding. But what Jill brought up, I think, is the, one of the most important things. It's it's so hard for us to have perspective beyond this minute or this year. But we, we, anyone in the medical field, we know what happens to people as they grow older. And here you've got this transition to assisted living facilities and nursing homes that are just, there's an epidemic of it yeah. in the United States for sure. And having been personally involved with people who've made that transition, women are strong, they're, they're willing to make it, but they don't like it. They yeah. don't like leaving home and going into this whole new situation and leaving their families, basically. And what gets them there? Hormone loss. 80% of the women who are in assisted living facilities are there because of hormone loss. Loss of muscle from low testosterone, which is a female hormone as much as it is a male hormone. Loss of ability to think clearly. Adult diapers, which is totally related to hormones, incontinence. And most of all, wheelchairs. They can function at home with a walker, but the wheelchair is a cumbersome moment. So what Jill says, I'm going back to what Jill said. She went right to the point. Yeah. This is what you really want to pay attention to. <laughs> it's what's going to happen when you're 80 or 90, because a woman's life means as much to her at 80 or 90 than it does in someone in their 20s and 30s. We don't care about life less. Yeah. And you still think you're in your 20s when you're 80, like you're <laughs> very often, right? <laughs> Ask an older adult and how old they think they are. Like, I haven't changed. I've been 30 <laughs> the last 50 years, right? Yeah. So you, you you don't, yeah, you don't feel old. And I'm a gerontologist, so we studied ageism and we realize that the most ageist people are older adults, right? And mm. I've had met so many uh, older adults who said I would never go to that place because there are a bunch of old people there. <laughs> <laughs> like, well, they're the same age as you, but in their mind, they're not. And so it's it's really important that we keep the body up with the mind and the way that we feel. And what I learned a lot, I mean, I went through the, the menopause method program with the Institute of Bioidentical Medicine, just like you, Jill, with, mm -hmm. that was created by Dr. Rosensweet. And so everybody's been hearing me talk so much about <laughs> what I learned and Dr. Rosensweet. And I was amazed that how few people know that in your thirties is when you have this steep and precipitous decline of progesterone. Certainly when I was in my thirties, I did not think about menopause or hormones or anything like that. So I think the work that you're doing and, and Jill, you as well is, is so important because I, as a gerontologist, I always say longevity starts in childhood, but now I'm saying menopause starts in childhood because <laughs> one of the things that we do as young people, adults or, or as children, they do, they will affect our hormones just the way they do aging. So I'm, I'm really grateful for, for you bringing that up and, and, and continuing to, to share that. And I do want women to start paying attention to menopause much earlier because one of the myths we have is, oh, that happens after 50. And that's what I'm going to pay attention to menopause, right? Is that yeah. what you're seeing as well in, in your circles? Constantly. I think it's like, there's no thought about it in your thirties, but I think in hindsight, right? The rear view mirror, when you, when you tell, when you're having a conversation or speaking to a group of people who are in their fifties and they're like, Oh, and you start to talk about what the different hormones do and the changes that can happen. They're going, Oh my gosh, that's what it was. And they just didn't know that. And I don't know how we can garner their, like get them to be interested in their thirties, because I think it's been thought of as being this, this thing that happens way later. So I think if we can get women, you know, kind of hooked into at least wanting to learn about it earlier, they're going to be just so much more prepared, you know, when in their thirties to know that this is coming much, much earlier than, than they're expecting. Maybe we need to rebrand the word menopause too. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> another aspect to it too. Um, yeah. We're, I think there is a gen, general reluctance to take a look at the older years and getting older 
But this particular field, gerontology and hormonology, has got an elephant in the room called women got scared. In 2002, when that false reporting of the Women's Health Initiative it was false reporting, saying there was increased risk when that was false, yep. it scared everyone away from wanting to think about these things and not wanting to think about hormones because women were afraid and so were the healthcare providers. If I'm going to treat, if I take hormones, I'm putting myself at increased risk. That happened to be false. In fact, I'd like to address that. But uh, so that also has tainted this whole subject about hormones. Yeah. Let's let's talk about that since we're on this topic then with the Women's Health Initiative, because maybe some people haven't heard about it. I would love for you to address the elephant in the room or the when the woman comes uh, to you for menopause treatment, she would may think, what's the risk? And will it increase my risk of heart disease and breast cancer and all that? Why, why are they saying this? And what would, what do you tell them? Well, a little backdrop to this. I mean, women and men have been treated with hormones for a thousand years. We have documentation of that. And then in the 1940s in the United States, the pharmaceutical industry was aware of the need. And they came up with Premarin and Prempro, pregnant Mary urine derived and by 2002, 40% um, of American women were on Premarin or Prempro. That, that was 18 million American women. And doctors were very free about doing it. There was no concern about risk. And then in order, the paradox was the study that was designed was to show that there were other benefits of taking hormones, but some quirk took place and some quirk in the committee that was uh, doing this particular research and someone broke through and reported in 2002 that there was increased risk. And when you read that study that exploded out into the world, millions in women and, uh, and healthcare providers all over the planet, all of a sudden got afraid that if they if women took hormones, they were at increased risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. And my but, understanding is that it wasn't even an official statement. It was some kind of a leak, if that's true. It was, if a, I remember. Quirk. It was a quirk. It was a pre-meditated leak, that's for sure. But what was actually in the study, because you can be sure I read it immediately, and what I learned was women on horse urine derived estrogen, Premarin, the most popular and profitable drug of all time up to that time, they, were on, they had less risk as reported in the study for breast cancer. Yeah. For those of you who understand relative risk, one is neither risk or not risk. They were at 0.79. That's less risk for breast cancer. That was in the study. Yeah. And the other statement was around Premarin combined with progestin, an artificial molecule that stated there was a 1.26 relative risk, yet that was statistically insignificant. That was in the study. Well, anyone who understands medicine and science at all, when you see the word statistically insignificant, you know, don't draw any conclusions, folks. There is no conclusion there. But that's not what the press did. And they just exploded it out like there was increased risk. Yeah. And 18 million women in America went down to less than 2 million overnight. Yeah. All the consequences of this. And the whole subject, if it was hush-hush before, because we don't like to talk about sex or genitals or hormones, for whatever yeah. reason, <laughs> men and women, we didn't know this about men until all of a sudden Viagra comes out and it's one of the most popular drugs. <laughs> Men were having erectile dysfunction. Men were getting that same hormonal decline. We don't like yeah. to talk about that. Yeah, I don't mind talking about it. <laughs> so what I'd like to do is actually tell you what the science is. Yeah. Because we know a lot. For one thing, the original study committee Follow, kept following all the women. And in 2017, they published a retraction in the original journal that they published it in. And they said, after 18 years of follow-up, there is no increased risk 
of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. They weren't willing to make a, a statement like, we're sorry that we did this. <laughs> no, yeah. they didn't include that in their retraction, but they did state after 18 years of follow-up, there's no increased risk of breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. But here's the science. We're all at risk for thousands of diagnoses. We're at risk for hundreds of cancers. We are at risk. And there's reasons for these risks. And as a male, unlike what used to be so, I'm at an increased relative risk for prostate cancer. There, Over other cancers, there's reasons for this. And women are at an increased relative risk for breast cancer. And there's reasons for this. Because when I was in medical school, breast cancer was not handled differently as other cancers. Given that we're all at risk, Here's the science. Women who are treated with hormones are at less risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke than women who do not receive hormonal treatment in menopause. Yeah. It even goes so far as women who've had breast cancer, they happen to have an increased relative risk of recurrence than a woman has of developing cancer. But women who have had that breast cancer properly treated are at less risk for recurrence if they're treated with hormones than if they are not. It's amazing. Why doesn't pe don't people know this? <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't, you know, uh, go figure. Uh, the human race just seems to thrive on something that reflects out their fear. And so that exploded. This information is leaking slowly into uh, the marketplace. It wasn't grabbed. You know, why not? I don't understand it, but it wasn't. And it, But people are out there saying, look what we know now. And then yeah. there's other studies that confirm the benefits of these hormones. It seems like you were probably the very few doctors who actually read the study because you're a true pioneer in this area. Not only will you were 30 years now treating women through menopause, but you were going through those two decades where it was so negative. There was such a negative light. And I'm sure that there've been doctors telling you, what are you doing? You are crazy. Uh, people, you must've got a lot of backlash. I mean, you had to be really strong to, pursue and still continue to help women and educate them and try to explain the science and the study. How did you do this? Uh, magic. <laughs> <laughs> For one thing, I wasn't alone. Like I immediately called a couple of colleagues who were treating women with compounded bioidentical hormones. And I said, look at this. And they said, yeah, we saw this. This is a false study. And it's, I wasn't the only one who saw it. Yeah, I know, but there were not that many who seemed to have taken yeah. the same approach as you. Well, there were quite a few because by the t by 2016, the pharmaceutical industry did another study because what they realized is that there was a lot of women getting treated again. Mm -hmm. And what they discovered that at the time, there was 6 million American women gone from 2 million at the lowest so by 2016, there was 6 million, not 18 million, 6 million being treated with hormones. And over half of them were on compounded bioidentical hormones. Hmm. And they saw that. And they saw that coming and they started developing these bioidentical, I'm putting it in quotes because I've, I have some significant concerns about this. But yeah. um, they, they did see that it was happening. So there were others, uh, and uh, I, wa I wasn't totally alone. And not only that, I think the main thing is, is I've had a very blessed career that for unknown reasons, I don't conflict with people. I don't go into this. I don't think we need this. I think we need, we need synergy, and we need cooperation, and we need to gentle, communicative exchange. And... I've been insulated from it. It's amazing. Wow. <laughs> Even though I'm right in the midst of the foray of the uproar, including the National Academy of Science, and I'm co-chair of the Committee to Protect Compound, and that's not like I've avoided the fray. I've jumped right in the middle of it. But yeah, it is. 
that's how I did it. Zora, you asked. So. <laughs> yeah. Jill, is there anything you'd like to add to that? You know, I, it's just, it's, it's so, it's so frustrating. I, I mean, I, and Dr. Rosensweet knows this because we'll get on the, get on a zoom and I, I, I kind of throw my arms up sometimes because I'm still, I think in the position I'm in where I'm dealing, you know, really hearing stories from women on the daily. It's so, it, the things that I hear from women are so, it just astounds me. And I just, I just, yesterday I got a message from a woman saying she had had a total hysterectomy two years ago. So ovaries taken out, her doctor gave her a prescription for the patch. It's sitting in her drawer because she said, when he gave me the prescription, he told me it will increase my risk for breast cancer. And I think, wow. you know, she's, she's suffering miserably. And that's just one of a million stories I feel that are, you know, coming from women, but it's, it's this frustration where we're still so stuck on estrogen causing cancer and this, in that we have to get off of this because it was, it never should have been said because it was never true to begin with. And it's still being said, and it's so pervasive still in the medical community that it's no surprise that women are super nervous and they're just unwilling to even have the conversation about hormones when we know that the benefits for most women out, outweigh the risks, especially if we're going to be living until we're 80 years of age. So it's just very, I love the way that you describe this, Dr. Rosewood. I love you walking through all the steps of the WHI and where this all came from. Because I think when you ask women, they don't even know, they'll say estrogen causes breast cancer, or they've heard that, but they have no idea why or how. So it's, it's, we have to continue to keep getting this message out. It's, it's just, I think too many women are still suffering. I mean, I think I last I read was like 4% of women are on hormone therapy. I mean, that's a low, that's a really low number Very when we're low. talking about all of these women that may end up in a nursing home or other, or with other chronic diseases that can be at least, you know, partially protected or, you know, supported, prevented with hormone replacement. So yeah. It's, it's even less in, in Asia as well. I think it's like yeah. 1% or something very, very small. And yeah. so it's, yeah, it's just women around the world. I think this is quite a global issue. It's not yeah. just in North America. And it's shocking how it, that, a, that a doctor actually would still give the patch to this client and say, you know, it will cause cancer. And mm -hmm. this is one thing that really stood out for me in Dr. Rosensweet's program was that you mentioned as you're training dogs, this is a program that's training doctors. And I went through it. You allowed me to go through it. I don't prescribe. I'm just curious to see how, what is going on on that side. And you mentioned really clearly, like if there's any doubt in that woman's face or you get uh, some clue that she's not convinced, don't prescribe because she needs to be hundred percent sure. Imagine if she's rubbing this cream or putting on this patch and having these thoughts in her head, like this is going like, to do something really bad to me. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm, I'm amazed that you, you mentioned this, Dr. Rosenstreet, and I'm really glad Such you an did. important thing, Zora. Such an important thing. Um, and what I tell my women patients when I see that doubt, when I see that concern, because every woman that I ever sit in front of in consultation, whether they language they're afraid of the risk, but some of them are desperate enough that they're going to go ahead anyway, so we proactively with every patient, we bring up the whole subject of risk. And I really just repeat what I did here on air. But if I still see lingering doubt there, I say, no worries. Let's pause. Let's respect your doubt. Here's my promise to you that if you investigate the science behind this, you're going to get to a place where you're going to know for sure, not this uncertainty that you have now, you'll know for sure whether hormones are right for you or not. And I, that's what I guarantee you. You have to do some legwork here. And what I suggest, and of course, your readers are welcome to have a free PDF download of our book. In chapter three, I go into the subject in more depth, and I refer to the, the greatest book on this subject that's ever been written. It's by an oncologist a medical doctor who specialized in breast cancer and his, and his scientific partner called Estrogen Matters. And what we do is we provide this resource for women who have the doubt. And so we say, keep walking through this material because you will know for yourself. And I say, respect whatever your intuition tells you.
Now, there is an interesting thing. You know, men can get prostate cancer. And even though men are at less risk for prostate cancer, if they have a good testosterone and are treated with testosterone, if they're not, that's the science. Women can get breast cancer. And these breast cancers or any cancer, you know, it's 10 to 15 years it takes for that to, to develop from a mutated cell into a lump that can be felt and identified. And I've always thought we have to be careful in this litigious world. Perhaps a woman is feeling uncomfortable because without her being conscious of it, there's a rise in cancer in her breast. And we don't want the situation. This is a, this is a sidelight, but it's something to take into consideration. We don't want the situation where that breast cancer continues to grow. And she's been treated with hormones and her doctor says, yeah, for sure. That was caused by the hormones. No, hormones don't cause cancer. It's like there the disclaimer that you, yeah, did not take supplements when you're pregnant or not use some device when you're pregnant. And it's just to cover the bases, just because you know that there's a birth defect that that person's going to blame the supplement or the device no matter what. And I think companies just go, I don't want to get involved, right? It sounds very similar to that. It's very similar. And people are being sued right and left. And that's why there's still a black box warning on every package insert to a pharmaceutical hormone. And also for the pharmacy, the compounding pharmacies, they have to give a warning out that estrogen could cause cancer. Oh, that's got to be real. The FDA is not caught yeah. up with the science, the pharmaceutical manufacturers, and what they're obligated to do. And this is why you see the ads on TV. This medicine is great for you. You're going to change your life, but you could drop dead if you take it. <laughs> it helps with the side so don't worry about it. <laughs> Do you think yes, that'll anyone. change that black, bo black box warning ever removed at some point? It's going to take this thing that's very unusual. Like, for example, in every branch of medicine, there's specialization. And this specialization has been a great thing. And for example, the body of knowledge for gynecology or urology or neurology, man, it's settled law because they decided to focus in and get good at one thing. This has not occurred yet in the world of hormones. So you've got a lot of people out there prescribing hormones and not knowledgeable about hormones. I was teaching at a conference and I heard a gynecologist who was also teaching at this conference talk about risk for breast cancer to this audience of professionals. And she had not even read the science. She was, she put out such a blur and she was a gynecologist that I, I looked at that audience. I went, they don't know. They're confused. They don't know if there's less risk or not. And I went up and asked her, have you read estrogen matters? No. So we're in primitive times of human consciousness in general. And it's the slow moving train, it seems, yeah. for people to do better stuff. But here you are, you're on the front lines. Jill's been on the front lines for a long time. And there's more and more and more of us. It's just wonderful how there's an explosion of people saying, wait a minute, what is the truth here? Yeah. That'll change it. It'll get there. Hopefully do you think there will ever be like a fellowship program. I mean, I could see it lending itself so well to, I mean, I guess we want nurse practitioners as well. They're such a great group. You are doing a lot of training of nurse practitioners, but it seems like there should be this specialty, this really focused training and mentorship like there are for other specialties. We're on it. Yeah. It's one of yes. our projects. Yeah. We feel like we've laid down the gold standard for standard of care. Yeah, we got a team. We know where to go next. Yeah, just uh, we want to get board certification for this. Yeah, and then pay attention to the board and the board who's knowledgeable. So anyway, well, you think that uh, medical school should eventually include sufficient menopause training? Do you think that'll ever change as well? Well, interesting subject. What I've noticed is there's a 30-year lag time 
between something good coming along that's actually true and when it makes its way into mainstream. And I have an example of that, but you may not, we may not need to go there. But I noticed that. I'd say, God, the best stuff was first proposed 30 years ago, and now it's made it. Okay, good. It made it. <laughs> yeah, 30 years. Okay, that's a long time. <laughs> really Maybe way it's been so lately, by then. <laughs> but I don't see it. I don't see it yet. Yeah. Yeah. Hopefully for our daughters, um, <laughs> that will change. But so, okay, let's let's talk about we talked about you know, you mentioned the the risks and some of the benefits uh, of taking hormone therapy. We shouldn't be so fearful. But what about the risks versus the benefits if we choose not to replace our hormones? Do you have any thoughts about that? Either one? Big time. Yeah. Jill, do you want to lead off on that one? Because you already mentioned it. Yeah. I mean, I think it's, you know, it seems that there are more, there is more risk to not using hormones than using hormones. And I think it's really just back to the physiology of the body, like any hormone. I think we've cherry picked these hormones to be like, they, women don't need them. We're okay with insulin. We think that's an important hormone. We think cortisol is important. Thyroid hormones tend, it tends to take women a while to get that diagnosis or to get that thyroid hormone, but we seem to acknowledge that. I think the estrogen, progesterone, and testosterone, we haven't as a whole really seen them as, we're still thinking about them as reproductive hormones. I mean, they're called sex hormones. So I think if we can just stand back and really, when you look at the physiology of the body and where these hormone are signaling receptors all throughout the body, it's pretty obvious that without those hormone signals, living in a body for a third to half of your life without having any hormone signals um, we're going to have a problem. And I think that's what we see. And I think Dr. Rosen, sweet, you just alluded to it. Zora, you've experienced it as a gerontologist. We see it later in life. I think it starts to heat up. I think women experience it and we'll kind of say, oh, yeah, I'm seeing, I'm feeling something in midlife, but it's really later on where we're maybe thinking it's just aging, but I think it's the hormonal decline piece. That is, it's a piece that we can't leave out of the whole physiology of the body, you know? So Absolutely. I think there's, I think every system of the body is impacted when we no longer have hormones on board. They're the, they're the most powerful biochemicals in our body. And like Jill just said, the receptor sites are everywhere. So you don't get to have healthy bones that aren't vulnerable to fr fracture without these hormones. For women, estrogen particularly, you don't get to have a, a clear thinking mind without the hormone. You don't get to have muscles. Gerontologists, I have tremendous respect for gerontologists who changed my life, lecturing to us senior medical students, saying, you're senior medical students, you know a thousand diagnoses. Well, let me tell you what's really happening to old people. They're losing their muscles and they fall on their osteoporotic bones and they die. And they're losing their cognition. Do You want to help them? Help them with their muscles, bones, and brain. And hormones are essential for this. Yeah. And that's what we teach in our, in our program. We say, we used to say there may be risk for taking hormones. We don't say that now. But we, and what we used to say is, but there's a near certainty of very deleterious effects from the lack of these hormones called bone loss, muscle loss, arterial risk. It doesn't exist with proper hormone treatment, or it's much, much reduced. There's risk for strokes. There's risk for heart attacks. There's risk for total loss of libido and the ability to have intercourse. You want to have intercourse when you're 80? Let me tell you. Yeah, that's the answer. <laughs> <laughs> you better have these hormones. I'm sorry, that was a little bit of a sidetrack there. <laughs> But I it's think important anyone, though we didn't cover this yeah. in gerontology. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think anyone who's experienced sexual uh, intimacy does not want to just give that up just because I aged, and you don't have to give that up. And that's that's a whole story I could go into further. But I we say we teach our our doctors and nurse practitioners there's a near certainty of a long list of problems. And, you know, let's just cut to the chase. We said earlier, why are these nursing homes 
and assisted living facilities in an explosive uh, number. And of course, it, it's affecting the whole healthcare system because they need to be there. Yeah. Because without the hormones, you lose your muscles, your bones, and your mind just for opening. Not everyone loses their mind, but a lot of a lot of women do. And you can't control your bladder, and you can't walk. You need a wheelchair. That's why they're there. And it, it, like one of our members of our medical board said, uh, who's worked with nursing homes her, her entire career, I asked her once, what percentage of women in nursing homes do you think are there because of low hormones? She said 80%. Hmm. So we say there's a near certainty of stuff you do not want to happen. Yeah. Everyone thinks we're immune to it, you know? 60 year olds i'm functioning it's cool i'm pretty good i still got a little bit left there 70 year olds wow i'm aging but i'm still going 80 year olds and not as much 90 year olds whoa if you yeah. make it to 90 um they, they don't see this they don't they're, they're not inspired by this but we see it so the best thing you can do Avoid the near certainty of these losses that you do not want to have. Do I, hormones. Yeah, I think as as much as I am pro hormones, I I do. My, part of my mission is also to disrupt age of stereotypes, and and I try to show people that even with the hormones, you still need that foundation. You still need to protect your heart, bones, and and breasts by doing some the appropriate exercise and getting the right nutrition that's for you. And you know, it's because sometimes we we. we we, it sounds like a miracle. And so a woman may be taking this and go, I don't need to do any of that anymore. <laughs> it's protected. And I don't think so. But what is your opinion? Because you have been working with women for 30 years. You've seen women age decades. You probably started with some when they were in their 50s and they're now in their 80s. What are you seeing with those who maybe you have been treating for a long time versus maybe a new woman who's coming in her 70s and or you've seen her from her 70s to 80s and how would how are they aging is it really you seeing these big differences joe would you come in first on that well i think you i mean you're seeing more of the i guess from hey, a patient sure. perspective if you don't mind yeah sure. i feel like that yeah. might be more yeah well for one thing any of us when we walk down a street, we can identify the women who are on hormones and the women who are not. You can see it. It's that glaring. And that's, what's at the essence of this question? What are you, the differences? Because I'm just I'm curious because you do have, you've seen a lot of women and okay, you, well, you have, you're you very have. experienced. You got the clinical experience for 30 yeah. years. So the, are the you seeing what this. we're, what we're proposing, you know, that this is going to happen. This is great. And I'm, I'd like you to share maybe some examples sure. perhaps of clients that you've seen and is it the sure. majority of them or is it these just exceptions? And you're right. The angel is in the details and the, in, like, for example, I've been treating women for 30 years and I, in my practice today, I have women that I've been, when I moved at one point, so I'm treating uh, women for 20 years and we follow them every year in an annual visit. And this is what you can tell. For one thing, you can totally see it. You can see it in the face of a woman as to whether or not she's on hormones. You can see it in her skin, but then all you have to do is ask about things like what's your sleep like, what's your libido like, how's your strength, what's your motivation like, what's your mood like. And the difference is like, for example, I had an 80 year old woman tell me that her goal for next year is to see if she can get 10 more yards on her golf game. How do you do that? Mm -hmm. And still having intercourse and enjoying it greatly and uh you you don't you see what what hasn't happened you see women enjoying their lives strong active participating fully and it's very important that participation because the older you get very often not always you can get wiser in your contribution to your family 
and to your workplace and to general politics in general increases as you learn more. So we see that participation in politics, for example. So it's in the daily stories. It's what I don't, it's what I hear and see, and it's what I don't see. I'm still walking. I'm still playing golf. I'm doing, I'm, I'm uh, exercising every single day and I'm motivated to do it. Hmm. So oh, then does it ever happen where you get a client like that and say, well, now my friend, she's seen me age the last 20 years and how we're aging differently. She also wants to start hormones at 70. What, do you, what would you say to that? Never too late. And I started treating my mother when my mother would finally let me treat her. She was 86. And she finally succumbed to treatment because she was losing too much. And my mother-in-law, same thing. Now, when a woman has been without hormones, it totally depends on the number of years, certainly 10 years, there are some special precautions we like to take, but it's never too late. We, we, we saw advantages in treating my mother and mother-in-law in their late 80s for the first time since, uh, since and they hadn't had hormones for 30, 40 years. Mm -hmm. So we evaluate every woman individually and we see gains. I'd rather uh, have the opportunity to treat a woman at a younger age. It's easier to maintain things than it is to get things back. It's easier to maintain the cognitive brilliance than try and uh, gain back when there's been major cognitive loss. <clears throat> Same with muscles. But it works. It totally depends on the individual. And like you said, Zora, I mean, this isn't the health into the um, elder years isn't totally about hormones. It's got some other moving parts there, yeah. including are you still walking every day or doing, you know, and eating properly, et cetera. But yeah, yeah that's your question. Go ahead, please. Yeah, no, it's it's, it's like this. It's like a circle too. I mean, when we tell somebody to exercise and and eat well, but yet they haven't gotten good sleep for the last decade, it, it's kind of hard. So I see the hormones as being a, you know a nice little uh, addition to help jumpstart some of these things as well. Not in every case, but yeah, you can see that happening. But I want to talk to Jill a little bit because I heard you speak on other podcasts too about this and. You, what is it when you when you hear this response and I, i've i've seen it all over as well when a woman says you know menopause is a natural process we've been going through it for millennia why interfere with hormones and just let nature take its course what do you say about that i mean i hear that all the time too and i think i think it is natural and it's a natural process but we weren't living this long before. I think that women think that, I mean, the average life expectancy in 1900 was 50 and average age of menopause is 51. So the average women were not living. We don't have this po huge population of women living to be 80 and beyond. So I think, you know, we're doing that because of modern medis medical interventions. We can keep people alive, you know, for a long, long time because of antibiotics and surgery and all these different things and I think, you know, if we're going to do that and keep, you know, and not address hormones, it's interesting because the natural approach to menopause that people talk about in Dr. Rosenstein, and I have talked about this a few times too, what do you see as natural? Because women will say, well, I'll try herbs. That's a very natural thing to do, but hormones are made in the body. They are the most natural. I mean, the, our bodies are used to them. Herbs are not made in the human body, nor are medications. So you know, from my perspective, I think of replacing hormones that have declined as being the most natural thing that we can do to help support a menopausal body. Um, and knowing now that we are living, you know, a third to half of our lives, you know, in perimenopause, menopause, postmenopause, it's a long time to not, you know, do something about it to at least address that hormonal decline. Otherwise what typically happens, and we all were just kind of alluding to is we end up on a slew of medications or other things to try to then, you know, it's like this whack-a-mole to try to address issues rather than treating the root cause. So I feel like if we can get behind it or ahead of it, I guess, and treat the root cause, 
um, which is hormonal decline. If we want to live to be 70, 80, 90 in good health, still playing golf, still having sex, still connecting with friends, doing all the things we want to do. It seems that hormones are the most natural thing that we can do. I'm wondering though, Dr. Rosenstreet, you, you mentioned perhaps we've been taking hormones for millennia. I'd like to hear more about that because when we think about it, if let's say we, we are living longer now in our eighties before, maybe it was in our fifties, but there were people living to the eighties back then too. It's just maybe not as huge of a, of a population as it is now. But even if they were living in their 50s, I'm, and I've never done the research on this, it'd be very interesting if either one of you know, is if even so, if they did live down to 50, they probably are in perimenopause anyways, and with their 30s and 40s, feeling those fluctuations of menopausal symptoms, and what were they doing back then? And, and I understand also there's this whole witch thing <laughs> that um, also women kind of got labeled that when they were kind of losing it through their perimenopause situation. But do we, either of you know, I'd love to hear Dr. Rosenstreet's, uh, what, what were the hormones that you say they were taking for millennia? And was it also because of this case, <laughs> these cases of all these women in their 40s, maybe? Well, first to honor the question you brought up, because I, like Jill, and probably yourself, have heard, well, I want to do menopause naturally. And uh, where did that come from? I think it was primarily uh, originated from the terror slash fear that I'm putting myself at risk. So yeah, I want to do it naturally. And you have a generation of women that got scared. And so they gravitated towards something that I don't think was as prevalent. They gravitated towards, I want to do menopause naturally because caveat I don't want to put myself at risk for breast cancer, heart attack, and stroke. The people that you were treating, sorry, I just want to interrupt. The people that, because you were treating people before the WHI study came out. Did you see a difference then where women had that fear after the WHI? Like, was there attitudes towards taking hormones oh, yeah. before that? Totally natural. Totally I didn't see fine. an attitude. I didn't see an attitude in providers. And I didn't see an attitude in women at all. Before the study. Before the study. Yeah. And just think about it. Most popular and profitable drug of all time, Premarin and Prempro. Doctors didn't have the attitude either. But back to the, the, the other thing is, the most clinically important thing is, where is this theory about natural menopause coming from? It is not the 80-year-olds who've had a fracture. It's not the 80 year olds who they used to enjoy sexual intimacy and they don't, they don't have it anymore. 70 year olds, 60 year olds, or tell a man who's lost his erection at 50. Well, it's just natural. These men don't want to hear that. They're freaked out. They're a gizzard <laughs> to have that happen to them. Or a woman who loves the relationship she's in and she's heterosexual and she's having penetrative intercourse and she can't have it anymore because of the atrophy of the vagina, which occurs when you lose your hormones. So it's, it's a theory to a certain population, but it is not a theory to someone who's starting to notice cognitive decline. Just before this call, we were uh, on uh, uh, one of our medical staff and myself were on with a doctor who was treating a college professor. She was in her 50s and she couldn't think anymore. And she was standing up in front of a class and she couldn't remember what she was saying. And she sought out the care and now she's clear as a bell again because she's on hormones. It wasn't a theory. She didn't have the natural menopause theory going yeah. for her. Yeah. But to give you a little background, I mean, the Chinese figured this out and published this, or at least uh, it, it became known a thousand years ago, where the aristocrats had set up this system where they had young, healthy women urinating into and collecting their urine. And they did the same for young, healthy men. They dried that urine out and they took the aristocrats had access to it. <laughs> they took the powders that because there's hormones in the urine. Wow. And so they figured this out a thousand years ago. And the pharmaceutical manufacturers even 
started working with that possibility. They were collecting the urine of pregnant women because they know there was this tremendous need, but it wasn't a efficient enough system. So that's when they chose, they switched to uh, choosing pregnant horses because it's a humongous volume of urine there and compared to what you can collect from a pregnant urine, it's easier to do. And so this is this was not such a subject. I want to do menopause natural to someone who's losing sleep. They can't sleep. They're getting hot flashes in the middle of the night. They can't sleep. And so I, I can handle about one night of lost sleep. <laughs> and I've dealt with women. They're not sleeping. And their mood is tanking. And uh, so it's not a theory to them. They don't necessarily cling to I want to do menopause naturally. We see them. They show up. It's And there's 20% of the women who do not have symptoms. The same degenerations that Jill pointed out earlier is occurring to their bones, their muscles, but they're not having the symptoms. And they're looking around and going, what is the problem? Menopause is not, I had an easy menopause. It's those women that I'm most concerned for. They have no motivation. And they've been scared by the possibility of increased risk, which is false. So yeah. there's a, you know, like any human and medical discussion, there's a lot of moving parts. There's a lot of complexities to it, but the theory doesn't exist in those who are breaking down. They're saying help. Yeah. Interesting. It's so interesting. So one question that I'm wondering is the woman who isn't going through the symptoms she's in her 50s let's say and she has no symptoms maybe her period's a little irregular we know she's in perimenopause for sure what would you say to her she comes in and says well i kind of heard this is supposed to be good for me or protective but i'm i'm not feeling symptoms should i be on this or not if she made it into the office there's something going on but i i think women you're the perfect example of it. And Jill is a perfect example of it. Because I know Jill, we've worked together for quite a while. You're saying, wait, we want to get this information out there. And you, Zora, you know you're not alone because you've referred other podcasters to us. I think this is the big thing. I think it's really important. And women often are the leaders in this area. Hey, listen, we've identified something here that really matters. Let's at least tell other women about it. Yes. The great, the great female network of the planet Earth. And we're at the early stages still, but there are many like you, and you probably know many more than I know. So I say this is, it's fantastic. We, we must get this word out and we must get it out for men. Yeah, um, you're right. We I mean, I'm not bringing, you know, I, I throw hints in there about men, but the same process is occurring. Peak hormones, 20. Some go faster, some go slower, but everyone declines. Yeah. And no one likes the consequences of those declines. And the risks are less if you replenish the hormones than if you don't. Jill, do you want to add to that? I do, I, you know what? One of the things I do find often is women who are sort of the women that you're speaking about who kind of feel like there isn't really a problem, but they're seeking out some support and some care. And, and some who have then gone on hormones and will say, aha, I didn't realize because, you know, hormones peak in our 20s, right? So at 50, we get so used to our new normal along the way that I think even even when you say 20% of women don't have symptoms, totally, totally believe that. But at the same time, I think you, knowing going through this process myself, Zora, you too, how could you not have one symptom? I mean, this is a major upheaval, huge life change, even doing all the healthy things, you still feel it. So I just wonder if it's more about, you know, we get so used to our new normal that we don't even realize it. And when we start hormones, we're like, oh, I can feel this much better. Things really start to elevate. It seems like it really sort of up levels the way that we feel. And I've, I've heard that from a lot of different women who say, I wasn't going to do hormones. I did them and then, and then realized 
how lousy I actually was feeling, but didn't realize it until afterward. Yeah, it, because we, I think a lot of the symptoms we don't even know about. We, we yeah. just to say, oh, hot flash, lost your period, uh, you know, blue libido, maybe some cognitive decline, but that's it. There's over like a hundred symptoms that can be related to menopause. So, so yeah. we would never make that association. And so I think even just trying, I mean, there's really a woman can go off of them. It's not like you start them and you're stuck forever taking these, yeah. right? You can yeah. backtrack if you want to. And I think that also, it's kind of like a money back guarantee <laughs> if you if you wanted to try, right? Yeah, yeah. So I have so many more questions, but I'm going to have to stop because we've reached the hour and I would love to continue this conversation in another episode. Would you guys be open to that? absolutely yeah for sure oh i think i appreciate both of you for, for coming and i and i hope people realized and, and understand that jill and dr rosensweet have been collaborating and they're just wonderful people and doing such great work uh jill has also gone through this program and, and so many so much more which you've heard in her introduction and before i let you go is there anything else that you'd like to share before in terms of events or programs or, or things coming up uh, that we need to know about? Jill, maybe you, you want to start? Um, I, you know, I have an, I have an ongoing um, community called Pausing Together and Dr. Rosensweet is a expert in that community and he comes in about once a month and we do a and a and we've recorded loads of Q&As. I think we have over 300 questions that have been asked and answered. So there's a lot of content, but that's a great spot for just sort of ongoing support for women. And we even have providers and health coaches and different people who are wanting to learn more about menopause. It's a great spot. And that's more of just an ongoing um, community for people if they're interested. Oh, great. I'll have a link to that in the yeah. show notes. It's the pausing community, correct? Pausing and, together. Yeah, exactly. Oh, sorry, pausing together. Yeah. Community. And Dr. Rosensweet, have got any interesting lectures? I know you you do the circuit a lot. Oh, what's what's in your world? Well, I think as far as your audience goes, um, we definitely offer a free PDF version of our book, and you can post a link to that for women who want to more know more of the details. And the other thing I. So, yes, and I, I've got stuff upcoming, and Dr. Berkson and I, and Dr. Brownstein, and Dr. DeRosa and I are about to do an estrogen uh, look into the estrogens. That's coming up. I think it's February fifteenth. You can contact uh, Karina; she'll know the date um, through our. Right. And then um, the the other thing is, oh my goodness. I think that's that's just about the most important things I'd have to say right now is, uh, oh yes, there there was another thought. That what it all comes down to, if you have interest and you think, well, gee, maybe this is a subject I think I want to pursue, what it comes down to for each individual woman is finding a provider that can write the prescriptions and that you trust and you like and you can be in conversation with like the human part of this whole deal. Those providers are out there. And, you know, in general, a, a physician or nurse practitioner or physician's assistant that cares and they're offering hormones, that's a great thing. Any mm -hmm. hormones by any method for someone who pays attention and is caring is a great thing. No matter where you are in the world, you can find those people. And that's your job as a woman to me, is to go shopping and find a healthcare provider who can write the prescription. These are prescription items, and you're going to need a professional, and you want a professional. I no longer work on my own cars because I've had, <laughs> I've had trouble with that. I, I like to find a mechanic who really is honest and knows what they're doing. And, and then... The process for every woman is really about shopping. And so how do you find a provider that you like and trust and a method that you like and trust? And one thing you do is you start talking to the network of women because women talk to each other. And I, I say in, in any friend group that you're in, someone's on hormones yeah. in your life. 
And you go ask them, well, how, what are you doing? Who are you seeing? Do you like them? There's other ways to do it. I mean, you can contact our network. We spend 80, I spend 80% of my professional life training and mentoring physicians and nurse practitioners. And there's, there's wonderful criteria you can use. And uh, so it's, it's going shopping, or you can go to local compounding pharmacists and you can say, you know who's prescribing this stuff. Who do you like? Who would you <laughs> recommend your mother go see or your sister go see? They do know. And they know the quality difference. They know the ones who really know what they're doing. And they know the ones who are new to it and maybe not so educated or specializing in it. So there's Very a lot of that, good way to that piece look at of it. work is really important. And I say the state of the art is topical estrogens and testosterone. You should apply to your skin. There's, there's reasons for that. And then the, the best is my favorite is... Uh, getting those in an organic oil base because you're applying this stuff for 10, 20, 30 years. But like I say, you find someone that cares about this subject and has gone out of their way to get the training. Because like you said, uh, Zora, this isn't so something that we learn in medical school. We learn it after residency or after internship. They care about it. They've gone out for the training. If there's someone that you trust, your intuition trusts, and they're into hormones, and you like them, almost any hormone treatment is going to be a benefit. But make sure they're also prescribing testosterone. Every woman needs testosterone. That's what preserves the muscle. In best case, they're doing 24-hour urine hormone testing, but you can get a lot of mileage even if you aren't. Oh, we have going to talk about all of these things in our next episode. And I love that you mentioned the organic oils and it brings up the question of what is it that we're slathering actually on our bodies every single day, right? And it's not just the hormones. So we're going to take a deeper dive into that next time. I'm going to have links to all uh, in the in this show notes to the book, the Happy Healthy Hormones book that you have, uh, Jill's free book, um, sorry, Jill's free menopause timeline as well. I have contacts for, for both of you, your websites, your Facebook, your Instagram all of that in the show notes. So please take a look at that as well as how to find a menopause doctor that is trained by Dr. Rosensweet. And that's the, the bright.live link as well. And uh, we'll direct you to more, more resources there. So before I let you go, I'd like to ask each, and, each of you, if you have any last words for a woman going through menopause, and we'll start with Jill. I think getting educated is the most important thing for women. I think women are so, if, if you're feeling in the dark, I mean, we try to, we get educated about everything else. If we want to get pregnant, we buy pregnancy books. If we're having a baby, we buy the baby books. If we're getting a puppy, we buy puppy books. <laughs> this, we're going to spend a third to half of our life in this phase of life. So this is definitely a, a period of time we want to pay attention to. So just get some education under your belt, because I think then when it comes to finding a provider like Dr. Rosensweet was talking about, it's really easy to kind of, you know, sniff out who's a good one and who isn't because you know, you know, your body best, you live in your body. Now you've got some knowledge under your belt. Now you're ready to go shopping and find the right provider for you. So the education piece I think is, is really number one from my perspective. I love that. And, and part of the education, at least for you and me, is the menopause method that we did yes. with Dr. Rosensweet. So we can yes. definitely highly recommend that, whether yeah. you're a practitioner or not. It's, it's a very interesting program. Mm -hmm. So Dr. Rosensweet, any last words for a woman going through menopause? I, I think I probably said the most important stuff, and, and Jill has just said it. And uh, other than these are wonderful and safe things. And they, they can make such a difference in your life. So explore the topic and see what you get, what your knowledge and intuition turns up for yourself. And if you make the decision, no, honor and respect it. Wonderful. If you make the decision, yes, do some of the things that Zora is offering here. Excellent. Thank you so much to both of you. I hope you have a wonderful day, the rest of your day, and I cannot wait to have you on again. Thank you. Thanks for Thank having you, us. Thank you, What an honor and a pleasure.